So good evening, everyone. I, I apologize for the late start. I was actually at convocation, sitting on the stage, patiently waiting, thinking that everybody was going to finish in time. But I got rescued by Paul and Paula, so many thanks to them. So uh, thanks very much for joining us tonight. So this is the third of our um, public speaker series uh, commemorating our 50th anniversary of the medical school. It really is my pleasure to introduce Sister Elizabeth Davis, who uh, probably doesn't need much introduction in Newfoundland, um, but I, I'm, I'm quite delighted because in some ways you're a rock star across the country, so, so I'm delighted. So uh, Sister Elizabeth is a congregational leader of the Sisters of Mercy of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, Sister Elizabeth was first a high school teacher in four schools in Newfoundland and then became the administrator of St. Clair's Mercy Hospital in St. John's and later was the founding president and CEO of the Healthcare Corporation of St. John's, which evolved in today's Eastern Health. She has received honorary degrees, Doctor of Laws, from Memorial University of Newfoundland and the University of Manitoba and has been named Alumni of the Year for Memorial University. Sister Elizabeth has been appointed as a member of the Order of Canada and an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And I don't think there's very many people get, who get to be honorary fellows of the college, so that's very impressive. Uh, she has received many accolades, which includes being inducted into the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador, receiving the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, and receiving the College of Family Physicians of Canada Scotiabank Family Medicine Lectureship Award. Sister Elizabeth's talk, I think it's going to be quite provocative, is an entitled Anniversary Shock, Dare and Affirm. The 50th anniversary of Munn's Faculty of Medicine is a pivotal moment of learning and building a healthy tomorrow. And on, not, on that note, I'd like to invite Sister Elizabeth to come forward and start our presentation. Good evening, everyone. It's a joy to be here. It's certainly a joy to be celebrating with you this 50th anniversary. I don't know if you know this. I'm sure you don't. It's actually the 50th anniversary of Mike becoming a Sister of Mercy as well. We call it our ju Golden Jubilee, so you can collect money afterwards to give me a present for my Golden <laughs> Jubilee. So I say hello to the people who are here in the lecture theater and to the people who are in the cloud uh, listening to us as well. So hello, everybody. It would seem a contradiction in terms to talk about a 50th anniversary and building a healthy tomorrow. With 50th anniversaries, we tend to look back. But there's a wonderful saying in Newfoundland when you row a dory, you don't look in the direction you're going, you look in the direction you're leaving. <clears throat> and knowing where the wharf is and where the headlands are, where the lights are, helps you go to the new place. So every anniversary that's truly a rich anniversary is a way of looking back in order to go into a better future. So you're using your anniversary as part of building this medical school, I think, is a very, very wise, very appropriate thing to do. I want to begin then with a quote from our best known poet, E.J. Pratt. You probably know his poem, Newfoundland, and in that poem he says, Here the tides flow and here they ebb, with a lusty stroke of life pounding at stubborn gates, that they might run within the sluices of our hearts leap under throb of pulse and nerve, and teach the sea's strong voice to learn the harmonies of new floods. Teach the sea's strong voice to hear, learn the harmonies of new floods. That is, what we, that is the essence of being a professional. That is the essence of being a profession. That is the essence of being a health system in this time in which you and I are privileged to live. We're living in a time that has not yet managed to turn its professions and its systems, in, bring them in line, in tune with the needs of people. People are changing far too dramatically, far too quickly, 
far too definitively for us to keep up. So we truly are trying to learn the harmonies of new floods, knowing how strong that voice is that we're, we're working with. So I want to do three things with you this afternoon. First of all, I want to look at the shock of looking back 50 years. There's only a couple of us, I suspect, here listening to this who were adults 50 years ago. But looking back over that 50 years, which in the grand scheme of things is a short period of time, then looking at what that says to us about the future, the dare, and then what do you have as a medical school that gives you the assurance that you can build that healthy tomorrow, that you have a part in doing that. So first though, my, uh, my connection with the medical school began when I came into healthcare care in 1985. A great shock to my system, but a greater shock to the province's system, I have to tell you. So I went three, four, four deans accompanied me. I knew Dr. Rusted, but I, only wor I did not work with him. But I worked with Dr. Cox first, then Dr. Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins would always say when he introduced me, uh, sister was born in my bedroom, I was born in sister's bedroom. Now that was factually correct, it just wasn't well explained. Uh, I lived at St. Clair's convent, which was attached to St. Clair's hospital, and the convent had been the original hospital, and my bedroom was the original obstetrics unit. So David, being from St. John's, was actually born in obst the obstetrics room at St. Clair's, but he missed that part whenever he introduced me. Speaking of shock value, I, I note the two pictures. The first picture of the people, uh, Premier Moores, you would recognize, the, uh, Mr. Eaton, you would recognize people who were here when this medical school was announced. Not a lot of women in the photograph. And then the opening of the, the cutting of the ribbon for this new medical school, many more women present in that image. And I'm glad, Margaret, you've joined the four, two other deans whom I knew really well, of course, Dr. Bomer and Dr. Rourke. So I'm glad you've joined that set to keep the balance here. I'm fascinated because I taught Latin at one point in my life. With, I'm always fascinated with the uh, coat of arms of this university, uh, with of this medical school. Um, life is a field of service. Very interesting imagery there. So, the shock. Let's look back for a few moments now at 1967. The average cost of a new house was $14,250. Average income, $7,300. Average monthly rent, $125. Gas cost 33 cents a gallon, not a liter, a gallon. The average cost of a new car, $27.50. The first North Sea gas was pumped ashore. The first ATM was put in service. There was this model who looked something like myself, Twiggy. <laughs> and that's when we had our first mini skirts, which were a great scandal. We had discotheques with those terrible rolling balls of black light. For the first time, color TV sets. Can you imagine saying this to young people today? Who were we listening to? We idolized the Beatles. They were old by then. They'd been around for three or four years. Jimi Hendrix, The Who, Janis Joplin, Simon and Garfunkel, The Grateful Dead. If you know these people, not retrospectively, but from your youth, what were we watching? The movie of the year was A Man for All Seasons. To Sir With Love, and guess who's coming to dinner? Star Trek, the original Star Trek and The Graduate were the movies of the year. And we all watched on our little televisions. We had two channels by then, pretty modern. The Beverly Hillbillies, General Hospital, and Peyton Place. Obviously, I came out of a Catholic family. My father, trying to be a modern dad, did not want to forbid us to watch Peyton Place. It was just a coincidence. He always decided to have the rosary when Peyton Place was coming on. Purely a coincidence. 
That year saw the first heart transplant, Dr. Christian Bernard, as you know. Uh, the Americans were still in Vietnam, and that year had peace rallies and riots all through the year. We had the Six-Day War in the Middle East. Obviously, that didn't get resolved very much, did it? Remember Biafra. For three years, Biafra had independence from Nigeria, and we remember the terrible fallout of that. Uh, for the, the world powers ratified the Nuclear Space Weapons Treaty that year. We celebrated our 100th anniversary of the BNA Act. For the very first time, indigenous rights were recognized in Australia. The European Communities was created, which was the forerunners of the European Union today. For the first time in the United States, the courts ruled unconstitutional a ban on, bans on interracial marriage. 50 years ago, the first black justice, Thurgood Marshall, and Expo 67 was held in Montreal. So these were the kinds of things were happening. And who were the leaders? Our prime minister was Lester Pearson. Charles de Gaulle was the French president, and he came that year and almost caused a riot in Canada. Vive le Québec libre. Kessinger was the chancellor in Germany. Gandhi, we had at least one woman. Uh, Brezhnev was the, in Russia. Johnson in the States. Wilson in uh, the UK. Pope Paul VI was in the Roman Catholic Church. Another woman, I think she's around still, actually, Queen Elizabeth II. And of course, our premier was Joey Smallwood. Now, that seems a lifetime ago, doesn't it? And there's one part of us that will sit and say how far we've come. Let's look at how far we've come. Let's look at the mosaic of our realities 50 years later. One place we've certainly come is that we now have on this earth six generations living at the same time. That would not have been true 50 years ago. Now, it's still only true in countries like Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand. But at this point in time, we still have people from all six generations who could be living in the same space at the same time. All formed with very different values, which makes for an interesting social context. But we do have the, the, the joy and the wonder of that. We also have a very different face of the family to some degree. To some degree, our image of the family has been mythic. But we certainly today know that the face of the family is very different. Our country was one of the leaders in declaring same-sex parents as legal. Sadly, one out of <clears throat> five families in, this, in big cities in this country are led by one parent. Not a healthy thing, probably. We have many more interracial families in Canada today. And for the first time in our history, we have more families without children than with children. You know in Canada, there are more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 15. It's a very rare phenomenon still on Earth although many countries are just trying to catch up to us. So we do have, in, in the census in 2006, for the very first time, we passed that mark of having more families without children than with children. We also have new images of older people. Now, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a, a coincidence, I think, of signs. It's from Britain. And Britain has these elderly people crosswalks. This one happened to be under the sign to the cemetery. And yet that's a very common stereotype of older people. We're simply hobbling our way to the cemetery. But that's not the reality of older people. Older people are like younger people, quite diverse, quite energized, enjoying each other and enjoying life. When my mom was 91, she gave her 85-year-old sister a computer for her birthday. Now, she said, Anne, if you don't have a computer, there's no way you're going to keep in touch with the children. 
So now my mom is dead, my aunt is 95, and if we want to know what our, if our nieces are pregnant or getting married, we check with her because she's on Facebook. <laughs> so my mom's strategy worked, but my aunt is regularly using her computer to communicate with people right across the world. So we, the diversity among older people is as significant as the diversity among younger people. Now, I'm an old woman. I'm 69 years of age. I know very few younger people who could keep up to my travel schedule. And yet, society deems me to be on my way to the graveyard. I may be closer than some to it, but I'm certainly living a very full and active and rich life on the way to that graveyard. So we've stereotyped, we stereotype people all the time, but one of the groups of our society who we, we really have stereotyped is older people. And since for the past 50 years, we now have many, many, many more older people. So those changing images, uh, the different faces of families, multiple generations, all that is good news. But all the news is not good. The United Nations uses this champagne glass of world poverty, a very ironic image, isn't it? The top, the richest 20% of people in the world own about 83% of the wealth in the world, and the poorest 20% of the people in the world own about 1.5% of the wealth. Now, there's something deadly wrong with that. And guess which part of that champagne glass all of us fit into. But I will tell you, it may, may not be the 1.5% group, but when I go to the gathering place, many people are well down that glass in terms of their resources, their access to this wealth that you and I share. Now, as bad as that is, Oxfam in 2016 brought out these numbers. There are 62 individuals on Earth with the amount, same amount of wealth as 3.6 billion people on Earth. And from 2010 to 2016, they increased their wealth by $542 billion, while the poor people, the 3.6 billion, decreased their wealth by $1 trillion. So, a lot of people challenged the Oxfam numbers and said, you need better scholarship, go back, and look what they found. Eight men, own, and they're all men, own the same wealth as 3.6 billion people. So they're not only were their numbers correct, they were actually understated. In their second study, one out of 10 people on this earth survive on less than $2 a day, and seven out of 10 people on this earth live in a country that has seen a rise in inequality in the last 30 years. And for the women among us, it will take us 170 years to finally reach pay equity if we continue as we're going now. So these are very startling numbers. So when we look back 50 years, in some ways we think so much has changed, but look at what has not changed. In Canada today, based on four indicators, economic status, health, education, and political influence, Canada is 19th in the world. It's not really good enough for what I think is the best country on earth. That to be, you're much better off being a woman in Ireland than you are in Canada in terms of those indicators. And for you in your work in medicine, look at children. A UNICEF study done in 2013, just in rich countries, shows Canada ranks 17th in the world in terms of child well-being. And when you look at health in that category, it's 27th in the world. That's not good enough for a country that should be at least in the top five. And all of these, so we can talk about the poor people in Peru or the poor people in Africa, but we need to look home as well in terms of a health system that responds to that reality. And we don't know if there's an increase in abuse. What there is definitely an increase 
in, is our awareness of how much abuse there is in our society. We, uh, and we know who are most abused in the society. Young children, spouses, almost all women, although not all women, and older people. And that abuse is physical, emotional, psychological, real. And again, our work at the Gathering Place is showing us how much abuse is happening here in St. John's. It's quite frightening, quite almost overwhelming when you see it so close to you. But there is abuse that's more subtle. In many workplaces, possibly on this university campus, there is abuse. Not physical, but certainly verbal and emotional. We also have on this earth at any one time 60 million people who do not live in their home country. And they are primarily, have been up until recently, primarily the result of oppression. So for example, our congregation is one of the groups in St. John's who sponsored a Syrian family who were refugees. The family came, two parents, three children. After we met them, they said, by the way, there are two more children. They're in Germany. Can you get them home? And we spent, uh, we were advised it will take five to seven years to get them here. And we managed to do it in five months, but only because we knew how to work the system. But there's a whole new group of refugees, climate refugees, that, that is a quite, it's a new language used by the United Nations. We know there are island countries in the Pacific that will be gone in 10 years and be underwater. And the tragedy of that is no country will take those people as a people. Australia has very strict immigration rules to keep them out. Uh, they, their leaders are struggling to find homes knowing that 10 years' time their home is literally underwater. Can you just picture that for Newfoundland and Labrador? What we're also seeing is a rise of radical extremism. Uh, Osama bin Laden was the first face that we associate with that in the modern age. Uh, ISIS is the main face of it today. But it has many, many layers, as you know. So the radicalization of young people happening here in Canada, in the United States, in Britain, is an, probably an unintended consequence of ISIS, one that ISIS is quite delighted with, I'm sure. But that radicalization of young people is a phenomenon we don't understand and we don't know how to deal with. And it's no longer over in the Middle East. It's happening in Edmonton and Ottawa and nearly every city in the United States now. But there's also another side of this, which is a rise in extreme fundamentalism, which is happening uh, across the world. And uh, I would think that President Trump is an example of that in the United States. Brexit is an example of that in Great Britain, some of the leaders who have been elected in Europe in recent times, not all, thank heavens, uh, are examples of that. But there's a rise in dissatisfaction that's driving some people to a world that's just very clear, it's very clear what the rules are, extreme fundamentalism, and it's driving some people into extreme radical action of destruction and anarchy. But it seems all to have the same root in a dissatisfaction with the rate, the pace of social change, and an inability to control my life anymore. We're, we pay no attention to that in healthcare or education, sadly. And the new kid on the block is we're realizing the vulnerability of Earth. The inner would say to us, you do not inherit the land from your parents, you borrow it from your children. But we have not been behaving as if we are borrowing it from our children. We're behaving as if we've inherited from our parents. 
and the earth, our extreme weather of recent months even, is an example of the destruction we're adding to on this earth and our failure to deal with it. So while in the 50 years many shifts have happened that have been quite positive, quite hopeful for human, humankind, quite hopeful for earth, there are many things that have not happened and actually have degenerated in that same period of time. And we have not found ways in our established systems, healthcare, education, business, government, to deal with the extent of those changes. In some ways, we're acting as if we still lived in 1959. So what, what's my, what am I daring you to? I agreed to come here to speak to you, other than I owe Kathy Vardy big time. I agreed to do this because I really believe that a place like this medical school is a place where we have some opportunity to help reshape a system that properly responds to the world we actually live in, not the world we came into 50 years ago. So what are the kinds of things? Well, I think even the definition of health is a good indicator of how we've shifted on that. When I started out in healthcare, the definition we were using was the absence of illness or injury. With that definition, we built the best acute care hospitals in the world. And with that definition, we built the best subspecialization in medicine in the world. We changed the definition of health, but we didn't change the health system. So the World Health Organization changed that definition. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Now we have a different understanding of health. We did not transfer that to health care or to health system. I myself like very much a better definition, which comes from the Australian Aboriginal community. Health does not just mean the physical well-being of the individual, but refers to the social, emotional, spiritual, and cultural well-being of the whole community. This is a whole-of-life view and includes the cyclical concept of life, death, life. And now we have a nuance on that. And that nuance is how ecology affects, affects human health. A healthy human population is dependent on a healthy natural environment. So you should be teaching in this medical school about sustainable health, not sustainable health care, sustainable health, providing health for today's generation without compromising that same opportunity to future generations. So we're seeing some language coming out of this. I just read just this week an article by Trevor Hancock. Some of your white-haired people in the room will remember Trevor from Toronto. But he's now at, uh, in British Columbia. And they're doing a very interesting uh, uh, piece of research on social referrals. Physicians making not clinical referrals, but social referrals using the same mindset of referring, but seeing this bigger picture of, of, uh, of health understood in that larger context. An interesting piece of work, and why I was reading it, is because of our work at The Gathering Place. For those who don't know it, The Gathering Place is an inner city center where 1,400 guests pay $3 a year to be a member. When we reopened the gathering place in 2014, we had 250 guests paying $3 a year. We now have physician practice six days a week in the building, family doctors, relatively new, working with nurses. But I've learned two things from the gathering place that I didn't know before. The first thing I've learned is what I call the intersection of vulnerabilities. The majority of people at the gathering place don't come for one reason. They have a mental illness, a physical illness, addictions, homelessness or desperate housing. They have possibly just out of prison or possibly in the sex trade to make enough money to feed their addictions. And all the study we've done can't tell what started what. Are you poor because you're mentally ill and addicted? 
<coughs> excuse me, are you mentally ill because you're poor and addicted? We don't know what the cause is, excuse me. <coughs> but we know those vulnerabilities are very mixed together. The second thing I have learned <coughs> is even the poorest of the poor in this city, there are two classes. There is one class in that poorest of the poor who, with proper supports ongoing, proper housing, can make a good life for themselves. But there's another group for whom that will not work. They can't come off the drugs. They can't come off the liquor. They can't come off the addictions. So they're not allowed to stay at Stella Burry or in the Wiseman Center. They're not allowed to go into housing. They won't stay anyway in the apartments. So when we talk about this different understanding of the health refers to the social, emotional, spiritual, and cultural well-being of the whole community, then we have a different view of health and the responsibility of the health system. And we are so pleased that these doctors have chosen to come to the gathering place to help us address the issues there. But we need addictions counselors, we need housing personnel, we need a whole spectrum of people, not just ones who deal with the actual health related health issues. They're all health related, the social determinants. So we have a traditional culture in healthcare in this country. Let's look at the indicators around the individual first, the patient or the resident. We focused on the care of the individual. This health sciences center primarily still looks after the care of the individual. And we talk about patient-centeredness and decision-making, bit of a myth still, bit of a myth. We struggle with quality and safety. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, care is relatively depersonalized in this building. Uh, we, priorities given to acute care. Myself and David Diamond have these conversations about long-term care fitting in here. And some still public mistrust of the system. The preferred culture, which I think on some indicators we're moving closer to, focusing not just on the individual, but the family, the community, the environment, involving the family, uh, the patient or client and the family in decision making, having a culture of quality, not just struggling with quality indicators, uh, personalized care, priority to that spectrum I talked about earlier with an increased confidence. When we look at the workers in healthcare, people like you, health professionals and other workers, we've had, we're not moving well into an alignment of your personal goals and the system's goals. We still have too many segregated professions getting better. You were doing some good, nice work here with collaborative education, but still not enough. Uh, we need healthier workplaces and we need passionate and humble leadership. Now, physicians and leaders don't not automatically translate into passionate, humble leaders any more than I do myself, I'm afraid. And our structures. Our structures are very tied to clarity of regulation, of structure, clear re regulations, uh, making sure everybody understands their place in this hierarchy. We have a very strong elitist language we use in healthcare. Uh, when I was a young woman coming into health care and coming out of education, uh, one of the sisters who was director of nursing came one morning and she said, Elizabeth, she gave me, in those days she got a nursing report in the morning, and she said, Mr. Brown, SOB. Now, I knew what SOB meant. I was surprised she knew, but I was really surprised she put it in writing on a piece of paper. I said, uh, mm -hmm, SOB, and she said, shortness of breath, we can't get to figure it out. <laughs> I realized then that my understanding of English and their understanding of English were two different understandings. And I remember picking on poor Dr. John Guy, who was on our staff at the time, and saying to him, if you can't speak plain English, you're not as smart as I am. So you know, if any of you knew John Guy, you know how well that went over. But we do have a very elitist language, very elitist, and our symbols as well are elitist. So what does this mean? How does this translate 
into how this medical school functions. How does this translate in terms of not how do you produce good doctors, but how do you help change the health system? What we know today, and we don't know everything, but we do know that there are nice harmonies that we have to keep in balance all the time. It's almost like a delicate band, dance. The person and the community, whether that person is a patient or a client or a resident or a physician or a nurse or a housekeeper, the person and the community. The professional and the interprofessional. Uh, I used to be accused in the past of wanting everybody to be the same. I don't. I think each profession has its own integrity and needs its own integrity. But working in silos is not a way to be professional. I'm going to come back to this collaboration and inclusion. Changing from a focus on expertise to true engagement, and I will come back to that. And then that earlier point I made about social justice into eco and ecological justice, always a balance, always a dance, each one important. When I did the uh, CFPC scholar uh, lecture, lecture in Toronto, one of the, the family physicians had the four principles of medicine, family medicine, and I told them they need the fifth principle, which is the ecological health, sustainable health. I don't think they pay much attention to it yet, but any chance I get, I keep reminding them of that. Engagement is complex. It's particularly complex when you don't speak the language of the other one, which we don't in healthcare, and we don't even culturally understand the other one. Coming from my little fishing village of Fox Harbor to go into hospital in this building, first of all, nobody can find you, and when they do find you, they're surrounded by such complex technology. So engagement has many faces. It's an easy word to use, and I've noticed people using it all the time. When I dig deeper, I'm not quite clear, though, which dimension of engagement we're talking about. Solidarity, uh, which is not too strong, ironically, in this hierarchy of healthcare, is all of us choosing together to change the system. Partnerships are arrangements, and you do good work in that in this medical school. Collaboration is still missing in healthcare. <clears throat> We've only gotten as far as cooperation for some reason. And finally, globalization. No longer can we stay in Canada or Newfoundland and Labrador. Our world now is so globalized <clears throat> that we have to influence. And I think you're beginning to do some, you're doing some of that work here at the medical school. One of your uh, colleagues from Britain says this, the development, maintenance, and enforcement of the values that define medical professionalism must be shared with the wider society in whose interest the profession is regulated. And he's speaking for the profession. The challenge for us as a profession, individually and collectively, is to establish a more mature relationship with patients and with the public which is based on partnership and mutual respect. We're further along than we were, I think, when he said that, but we're still not very far along. I like the way the Newfoundlander says it. I'm sitting on my stage head, looking out at where Skipper Joe Irwin's schooner is riding at her moor and thinking about how weak are the things that try to pull people apart, differences in colors, creeds, and opinion, Weak things like the ripples tugging at the schooner's chain. And thinking about how strong are the things that hold people together. Strong like Joe's anchor and chain and the good holding ground below. One of the gifts of our time is our final recognition that diversity is gift. When I was a young girl growing up in Fox Harbor, all Catholic, except one man who was married to a Catholic and they had 13 Catholic children. Diversity for us was my mother saying, now when you go up to Dunville, where there were Protestants and Catholics, when you go to Dunville, don't throw rocks at the Protestants from Dunville. So that's what her understanding of diversity was. 
What I know today is that if an organization is not diverse, it is not healthy. If an organization doesn't not only recognize diversity and celebrate diversity, but actually engage diversity, it is not healthy. The problem with this is you have to be inclusive to do that. And I remember speaking to the Toronto police, huge auditorium, about 400 Toronto police men mostly. They, wanted, they were trying to get into community policing and they were bringing some outsiders in. Uh, how I ended up there, I don't know. But I was speaking to them and I said, you know, it's a bit of a joke, isn't it? To community policing in Toronto. And they kind of thought this was very rude, but what can you expect from a Newfoundland woman? I said, I'm looking at you, almost all men, almost all white, almost all English-speaking Anglo-Saxons. Toronto is not all men, not even half men. It's certainly nowhere near half white, and it's certainly not Anglo-Saxon. 43% of the people who live in Toronto are foreign born, not counting us Newfoundlanders. They had a struggle, they still have a struggle to, to, to go from their culture into community culture in that city. So diversity then means inclusion. Now there's visible diversity and we're much getting much better at that, I think, although I'm not quite sure yet sometimes that we've quite gotten there. So we, we know what that diversity is, but there's also an invisible diversity. And that is the ways that we are individually different. When I look at this group here, I don't see much diversity, very much diversity in terms of the visible diversity, but I suspect there's lots and lots of invisible diversity. Now in healthcare, we have spent billions of dollars trying to keep you from being diverse. In every professional school in, in the health system, we try to make every doctor look like every other doctor, every nurse look like every other nurse, every physio look like every other physio. And we spend an awful lot of money trying to make that happen. And that was a mistake. That does not mean not having quality standards, but it does mean celebrating diversity, living into diversity. Which brings me to a new learning in my own life around boundaries. Before I came into healthcare, I would have seen boundaries as walls that protect me from the outside, places to define our separateness from your separateness. Whether it was St. Clair's and the Grace in the old days, acute care and long-term care, whatever the boundaries was, or what I recognize now is boundaries are the richest places we have because wherever there's a boundary, you have an opportunity to see someone, to engage with somebody new. You have an opportunity to come to another perspective. So just as diversity and inclusion are incredible gifts, boundaries are. I gave a talk once in this city at a national convention and on the panel with me was a minister, Lutheran minister from Stavanger in Norway. So I graciously welcomed him, gave my talk, sat down, he got up and he said, Sister Elizabeth is wrong. And I thought, now I was really gracious. <laughs> what is wrong with this person? How rude he is. He said, Sister Elizabeth welcomed me and she said, you know, Newfoundland and Norway are separated only by the Atlantic Ocean. I need to correct her. Newfoundland and, La and Norway are joined by the Atlantic Ocean. It was an important symbolic learning for me in terms of what boundaries truly are. Places where we meet, where new relationships take form, where true engagement and growth happens. So you have an awful lot to be thankful for, for those 50 years that you've enjoyed. Uh, you have strengthened the medical profession in this province incredibly. And the medical profession itself is a gift to us as a province, as a country. But the medical profession must always remember 
you are a profession because you've done the study, but you're medical professionals because we give you that sacred trust. And that you have to remember that you carry a sacred trust from us, which we can take away. So that that obligation that you commit to, to place first the well-being of your patients is not mythic or not a, that's just language. It truly, truly, truly is a recognition that we as a society value you very, very highly. It's a trust we place in you. It comes at a price to you, even as it does to us. Dr. Feinberg from the States says it this way, no matter how molecularly dissected the diagnosis will be, no matter how much information you have about any one organ system that may be malfunctioning, you're always going to have to take a step back and keep in place, in mind, and in your heart, the whole of the person before you. I remember an interview I saw with Dr. Nigel Rusted on his 105th birthday. For those who don't know Dr. Nigel Rusted, he was Dr. Ian Rusted's older brother. And on, at 100, age of 101, took out his five-year insurance on his car. He felt that might be long enough. And was just barely. He was talking to the interviewer, and he said, what would you say to medical students today? He said, well, I always speak to medical students. And I always tell them, it's not the broken, bed, the broken leg in bed two. It's the person in bed two. So... What have you got to be proud of? Your clinical disciplines. I've been very proud of my connections with all in each one of those disciplines. You do wonderful work, and you're continuing to do that. So you have that richness that you rely on. You also have created all kinds of entities within this medical school that take a piece of this bigger puzzle and deepen it and enrich it, and I'm so so glad and happy for that, so grateful for that. And you also have wonderful partners here uh, right around you in this university and in this medical school that strengthen who you are. So from all the citizens of this province whose, whose lives are richer and I do think healthier because the medical school exists, I say thank you. And I want to do it in the words of a blessing. And I give this blessing to you individually. I give this blessing to this medical school. And I give this blessing to the medical profession itself. May the light of your soul guide you. May the light of your soul bless the work that you do with the secret love and warmth of your heart. May you see in what you do the beauty of your own soul. May the sacredness of your work bring healing, light, and renewal to those who work with you and to those who see and receive your work. May your work never weary you. May it release within you wellsprings of refreshment, inspiration, and excitement. May you be present in what you do. May you never become lost in bland absences. May the day never burden. May dawn find you awake and alert, approaching your new day with dreams, possibilities, and promises. May evening find you gracious and fulfilled. May you go into the night blessed, sheltered, and protected. May your soul calm, console, and renew you. Thank you. I understand we have some time for questions. Thanks very much, Sister Elizabeth. It was very provocative, and I think you gave us a glimpse of what was happening in 1967. <laughs> really kind of hit home with all the key issues that we have currently in our society, and some um, thoughts about what we should be doing differently as we move forward. And uh, after the end, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our strategic plan, because 
what you've said has helped oh, good. me uh, conceptualize a few things. So are there some questions for Sister Elizabeth? I'm not sure if I can articulate my question, so I'm going to just share a thought and then you can take it from there. Um, with regards to the globalization point that you made, uh, with Memorial University having in its mission a special responsibility to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, I don't know where I'm going with this question, but I'd like to elaborate a little bit on the special obligation that we have for our province and the concept of globalization layered on each other. <clears throat> That's an extremely good question. Uh, the, the reality is Newfoundland and Labrador can't remain on its own, even if we wanted to. If this morning Mr. Trump treats the wrong thing, our interest rates could go sky high. And then this medical school would pay a big price because the government can no longer afford to fund you at the level it does. So we're not immune from what happens in the world, and it can happen pretty quickly. The extreme radicalization is an example of that. So there's one degree to which to protect the people of Newfoundland and Labrador requires our knowing the global realities and knowing how they have impact on my life, our lives right here. So that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is that we have learned there is a lot of globalization of greed. There's a lot of globalization of insanity and fundamentalism. There's less, there's becoming, there are all kinds of movements now for globalization of good, of well-being, of supporting one another. And every family in this province or every parish in this province, every church in this parish who, or in this province who supported a Syrian family are bit by bit helping globalize goodness in the world. Uh, one of the uh, writers whom I read frequently talks about the globalization of compassion can only happen one act at a time. Now that's not just one act I do as an individual, but one act this medical school does, or the Center for Nursing Study does, or the government of Newfoundland and Labrador does. Uh, I was recently <clears throat> invited to be part of the Tax Reform Commission and I had to say no because of time commitments. But the minister said to me, we need someone which, who has your voice when we're looking at this issue. So globalization is how we're negatively affected by the rest of the reality around us. But it's also how can we positively affect that and make changes in that. Now, the problem with the medical profession is we expect you to be leaders. We have a very high regard for our physicians, but that regard comes with a very, very high expectation of physicians. And this has been part of uh, my conversation from the time I came into healthcare. One doctor said to me, sister, you expect too much of me. And I said, I hope that's what they write on my headstone. <laughs> You know, uh, when I got the Order of Canada, the person who was reading the thing said, Sister Elizabeth can never leave well enough alone. And that was the best compliment I think I ever got. Because we do expect from physicians that you will help us when we get our cancer or our heart disease. But you are also the ones who have the, the physicians and the people who support the physicians in this medical school you have that capacity to help us see beyond ourselves, but you don't use it enough. You don't challenge us, of us enough. And we don't challenge you enough to make you do it for us. So it's a, it's a kind of, globalization is part of the reality of being alive on this earth today. So the next hurricane we get is because of globalization because of the temperature of the waters caused by our inappropriate behaviors. So physicians have a say about that. Public health is part of your mandate as a physician. So globalization does matter. We have sisters in Peru. Uh, last, from January to March this year, Peru got 10 times as much rain 
as ever recorded in those three months before, because the temperature of the Pacific had gone up quickly seven degrees higher than normal. Now, what did that have to do with anything? Our sisters live in two communities in Peru. One of those communities had such heavy rains, almost everybody lost the roof of their house. The poor people, not our convent, we kept our good roof. In the other community, mudslides came and wiped out house after house after house. And when I went down in March, they asked us, we asked, the, we asked the sisters to organize some, how do you respond to that? It's so overwhelming. So one family, families had a choice. You can buy, get us a bed from us, tables and chairs from us, or a stove from us. So we went down to help distribute to 135 families. That was globalization of compassion. But what they gave us back was even more globalization of compassion. These people who had nothing, who had mud in their houses up to their shoulders, who were living on their roofs and needed fly oil <clears throat> because the flies were eating them and water because it was 30 degrees. Every family gave a sole, which is about 40 cents Canadian, so we could be taken out to dinner. And I said to the sisters, we'll go out to dinner, but there's no way I'm letting them pay for our dinner. They said, Elizabeth, you can't do that to those people. They need to give back. So that moment, of that, the temperature of the water, we could say, that's not my business. The four times, 10 times as much rain, that's not my fault. But it is my fault in a way. And how do I respond to that? Ordinary people, an act, good act at a time. You have to be, your medical school has to be a leader in that as much as it does in proper cancer care. You, you've noticed you puzzled, you touched one of my hot buttons. <laughs> Other questions or comments? So Sister Elizabeth, as I mentioned, we're going through strategic planning. And so we're trying to craft our vision. Mm -hmm. So part of that vision we started off with to improve the health. We started off with the health care. And our Division of Community Health and Humanity said, mm -hmm. just as you did, it really has to be health, not health care. So we, we remove the health care. Um, and our three pillars, of course, are education, research, and social accountability, accountability, community engagement. And I just wondered if you could give some wise comments around um, how can we better as a school engage with the community? Because we have those programs that you put up. But in a meaningful way, how can we enhance what we're already doing? Now, you are doing it. You know, the, the work at the gathering place I keep coming back to because that's the poorest of the poor in, in our society, in this city. Medical school is directly involved there, which is the faculty of medicine is directly involved. It's, um, we, you have a problem here, and the problem is you're so highly regarded that you're separate from the rest of us. It's not like ordinary people. That starts, so there's a gulf to start with. Then you use that language that's a different language than we understand. And then you, uh, you sometimes listen to us and then go do what you're going to do anyway. So the engagement is just a polite facade. So you can check that box off. We engage with the public. How do you sit and have ordinary conversations with ordinary people and show them where that conversation is going? So that's not a 10 minute conversation or even a two hour conversation. How do you systemically build in that kind of engagement? I think it's the biggest challenge you're going to face. And when things get tight or struggle, you'll drop that and go to the important things. And we know that. So you need to convince us this is not about just putting a Band-Aid on. This is truly about what we need to know. Now, you have some incredible allies here. Uh, the work that's been done in Labrador, uh, Michael John is probably the most well-known symbol of that after Wilfred Grenfell. Uh, the work that's being done in rural Newfoundland, the work being done at the Gathering Place, you have little pockets all over the place. So how do you even connect the dots there so that they all help the other to, to be strengthened? 
The other piece of this, which is also, I believe, important, is how do you engage with the thinkers, the people who are the researchers, so that they can begin to articulate some of the underlying, the key, the key sentences here. Uh, not easily done, again. <clears throat> I fought for years and years and years and years to change how research happens. I think we're finally starting to see some signs of that changing. But I think it's really taking it seriously, not as a kind of a, a little frill, a little extra that we do, but fundamentally seeing that is at the core of, if you're going to build a healthy tomorrow, you can't do it alone, but you can be a catalyst for our doing it with you. Once you look through that lens, it's amazing how you see everything differently. Now, that's not very wise words, but, um, but I learned the hard way that if you don't see through that other lens, nothing is going to convince the other person that you're really serious about this. And why would I invest my time and energy with you if it's going nowhere? Because one, one of the thoughts uh, that I had is about having a community advisory or reference groups around different topics and just wondered what you thought about that. I can tell you it never worked in my day. <laughs> we brought in a program-based approach. Some of the oldest people in this room will remember those days. And I was you know, a new modern leader every program had to have a community advisory council. They had to, if they didn't, they had to prove to me they were engaging somehow with their community. When it started off, it was wonderful, but we soon learned that it didn't go anywhere. It worked, it kept my conscience stay a little bit clean until I got deeper into the reorganization. That's all it really functioned as. Because the people whom we brought in to work with us, we never changed very much based on what they advised us, because we knew better. We know better how to run acute care hospitals. And so we never found, we didn't go deep enough down into what engagement really means. So I'm not sure that will work as a, based on that experience, but how you get the kind of the, the rhythm, the balance, the dance that really makes a difference, I, I can't give you the answer to that. Nor can I point you much to literature that shows anybody else has the answer. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I hope you keep it. How, when does the anniversary actually end? And December 31st. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Medicine, thank you Oh, you did so get much. me a Golden Jubilee <laughs> present. We did. Thank and you. I didn't even know. So congratulations. <laughs> I really enjoyed your speech. And thank thanks so much. much for your interest in our school and the wise words. So thanks very much. Very much. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> and I think we have some snacks out in the back or oh, in the back of the room. In the back room. In the back. Oh, here.